Ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope you all had a pleasant evening. We are back on the record in the matter of people versus purse house. All jurors are present, including the alternates, all counsel present, defendant as well. We're going to continue with Officer Fizek, whose uh, testimony we interrupted. You can take the stand if you would, Officer. Reminder, you're still under oath. But before I do that, let me read a stipulation to you. Um, you can ask it. And I explained uh, last time what a stipulation is. Do you all remember that? The stipulation is an agreement uh, between counsel or among counsel regarding a fact or set of facts as having been proven by the evidence, and you're to accept them as such, all right? And the stipulation reads as follows. Evidence of Amy Harwick's state of mind regarding her fear of the defendant, Gareth Pursehouse, is being admitted via Amy Harwick's uh, email to herself and statements to friends for a limited purpose to show that she would not have consented to him entering her home and would not have consented uh, to him lying in wait. You may consider that evidence only for that purpose and not uh, for any other purpose, all right? There it is. Now, the prosecution um, advises this court that they believe they can rest uh, next Monday uh, with presenting their case. The defense will call witnesses. Again, they have no burden, but they will call witnesses and so forth. And so i just given you an update of where we stand at this point, okay? Now, you may continue. I believe you have transcripts. We left off at page 17. <coughs> New transcripts. Yes. Page 17. And I believe on the video, which was People's Exhibit number. Exhibit number one. Thank you. Your Honor, if there's anything additional that, that we can try to... So, I'm the biggest thing I need to came to mind for me is she recently saw a next that she had a restraining order against and she was worried about it. When was that? Um, a couple of weeks ago. I said I had a sex therapist. She's a sex therapist. Okay. Yes. okay. Where's your idea, sir? In my wallet. Do you 
know where her ID's at? No, I don't. I don't. I don't. You want me to come out? Yeah, go back outside and sit, sit with her. Sit right there with her. Hey, partner, come out. Come out. There's a... Uh, There appears to be a light there in the backyard at the very top of the building, is that correct? Yes, sir. And was that light always on uh, while you're back there in the backyard? Yes, sir. And did you turn it on or was it on by itself? Uh, we did not turn it on. So you don't know if it's a motion activated light or otherwise? Correct. Okay. But at, at least while you're in the backyard or people are in the backyard, that light was on? Yes, sir.
they're, they're door knocking a couple others to see if they heard or seen anything. No, I'm just, I just got his idea. Once, 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 Stopped it at three minutes and two seconds. Um, someone states she's not answering anything. Who, who made that statement? Uh, Officer Edney, my partner. Okay. And at any point, did the victim ever answer any of your questions? No, she did not. Did you ever see, hear her answer any officer's questions? No, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we can look up any saying this is your I was okay can you describe to the jury uh, what you observed at that point I observed a uh, dried up puddle of uh, yellow like substance um, resembling urine okay. did it appear to be uh, 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 recently uh, placed there okay. uh, well can you describe more uh, uh, the viscosity or, the, or what it appeared to you to look like uh, the puddle appeared to be recently dried. Um, it uh, had a strong odor, um, not consistent with uh, uh, urine that had been sitting for a while. It appeared to be fresh. Objection to foundation and speculation. Well, I'm allowed that it appeared to be fresh just then. <clears throat> could you smell it? Yes, I could. Was it a strong odor? Very strong, yes. Why would you say it was very strong? Uh, just because it, was, it was, appeared to me to be fresh. Um, and the odor of urine is, uh, is, a, is a pungent smell that I'm sensitive to. Okay. And the location of this uh, urine, uh, where exactly was it? 
Uh, it was in the hallway just outside of the bathroom or at the door of the bathroom. And that's the hallway between uh, the room on the right, which appears to be like a TV room, and the bedroom. Correct. I flipped it over in, in re reference to the phone. Uh, my partner, Luke Edney. And was that phone on the bed when you first observed it? Yes. And there appears to be like a handbag. Was that uh, to the side of uh, the bed? It was. that there's some beads out here outside in the balcony uh, my partner okay and did you see beads out there I did did you see beads out there before you walked to that location yes that necklace right there what, what are you talking about I was referring to a uh, necklace that we had observed uh, inside the house I believe it was in the TV room if I if my memory uh, serves me correctly um, that was broken and these beads look similar to the beads from that uh, that were in the TV room correct I already looked inside there it's got cards See, I didn't look at that one. FD was asking for me. How long ago do you think we got here? The messages on the nest thing show about. Yeah. Yeah, that just it just felt weird, you know? 
At this point, you're asking Mr. Michael Herman some questions. Yes. And he makes it clear that what he heard was a struggle. It sounded like a struggle. Correct. Anything like that?
what we're trying to figure it out. I mean, it's 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 hard to it's hard to decipher. You know what I'm saying? Because nobody really saw anything. We're going based off what you said that there was a struggle. But again, we get here, there's nobody there that doesn't really look like there's a sign of struggle up there. Um, like I told you, there's a there's a there's a rig of heroin up there. Yeah. No, I understand, yeah. So when you ran out there, she was in opposite. She was not out there. She was not out there. I was ran out. She was still upstairs yelling when I ran out. Right. says here, I believe you're part of saying he's calling a night detective. What, what does that mean? Um, at that point, we determined that uh, it needed to be a crime scene. So in effort to uh, assist with the crime scene, we uh, contacted the uh, night watch detective that's at uh, the station to assist with that. Okay, and would they take over the investigation once they arrive? Correct, yes. Somebody else was here. 
and he didn't want to die, so he runs out. <clears throat> he runs out, goes around this way, and jumps that fence. It's like it's got the, 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 the spikes in it, and that's how he got that. That's what he said. That's it goes there. Yeah, but he, he's got, I, I looked underneath, he's got, like, stab marks on this. She has no wings on her to speak for him. I looked for, like, defensive yeah, 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 yeah,
and sometimes it can be relevant uh, in how it affects jurors and how it would affect jurors' thoughts about a case. Objection calling for speculation. So sustained. All right. You wrote a report in this case. Yes. And you wrote it at a time when the events were fresh in your mind. Correct. Um, and, you know, in line with your training, you included all of the important facts from your response to the call. Yes. Um, you included all of the important observations you made in the house. Yes. Uh, you included all relevant important observations you made in the exterior of the house. Yes. And you included, you included all of the important statements told to you by witnesses. Yes. Your uh, report was complete, true, and accurate. Yes. Now, um, on your way over to 2086 Mound Street, you actually got lost, right? For a brief time, yes. Okay. I have uh, the beginning of your approach. I'd like to mark it as the defense is next in order. A double O. What, what is it? It's just the first few minutes of the approach that were clipped from the body of one. So it's a DVD? It's a DVD, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I, I have a transcript here of just that excerpt. I'm not playing the entire video of his body work. Okay. I'd, like I'd like to mark the transcript double uh, O one. Yes. May I distribute? <coughs> yes, you have one for each of you. Mm -hmm. Now, officer, your your the audio on your body worn doesn't turn on until about a minute in, right? Two minutes. So I'm hitting. I, I jump forward a minute because uh, this is when the the audio turns on. So I'm hitting play at a minute over four. And this, this should also correspond with the beginning of the transcript. Um, I'm going to approach and provide a transcript to the officer if I may. Yes.
perspective of, of the body worn video that we see is from you, right? Correct. And so you're the passenger and officer, Edmund is the driver. Yes, sir.
Hey, sir. How can I help you? Okay, hold on. Okay, so do uh, so you have access to here? No. Is there anybody else inside the house? My roommate. Just your roommate by yourself? Yes. Dude, I heard screaming. I don't know if that guy had a gun or a knife. I came running trying to... I couldn't find my phone or So is there somebody else inside? Yes. So I think there's... Okay, sir, do me a favor. All right, hidden pause at 626. <clears throat> um, so that was your approach to 28. 2086 Mount Street, right? Yes. Now, I'd like to turn to People's 28 and just highlight um, a couple moments. And if I may, open it from a digital file that I saved onto my uh, computer. And I'm going to be staying here at the council table because I'm going to be going to certain parts of the video. Okay. Um, so, so I'd like to go to when you first come around um, the corner into the patio. So I'm going to timestamp uh, six, ten, and just for the for the clarity of the record, this is the actual time of the video, not what the the body worn time says in the upper right hand corner. So this is the minute and second that is on the uh, recording. So you come around, and you already addressed this on direct examination, but the, the actual time of the night um, is up in the upper right-hand corner. Now, it's not actually 9.30, it's 1.30. Correct. Okay, 1.30 in the morning. So I'm hitting play at uh, 6.10. And I'm hitting pause at 618. Um, so this is the first time that you and Officer Edney see this person who's on the, pa on the patio, right? Yes. And the first thing that happens is Officer Edney walks up to her and gently touches her back to see if she responds. Correct. Um, on direct, you testified that you were concerned that she might have some sort of neck or spinal injury, right? Yes. So you didn't want to move her? Correct. Um, you didn't want to potentially make the situation worse? Yes. Um, you wanted to leave any sort of medical intervention to the people who had adequate training, like the paramedics? Yes. Um, so when Officer Edney touches her back, he doesn't, he doesn't like roll her over? I'm not sure I didn't touch her. <clears throat> I'm gonna hit play here at 6.18. Sir, come on. Sir, come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Relax, take a seat, take a seat. Come on, okay, so hitting pause at 6.26. So <clears throat> do you recall that moment when Officer Eddie kind of goes up and gently pushes her back? You were there in the patio with him, right? I was there, yes. Okay, do you, do you recall him kind of bending over and just gently seeing if she was responsive? I don't recall her, uh, him ever touching her. I do uh, recall him speaking to her, though. Okay. Would it refresh your recollection to watch a section of Officer Edney's body worn? Uh, possibly, yes.
Can you see well enough? I do, yeah. Did that refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. So, Officer Edney walks over and gently touches her with his left hand, right? Yes. Um, and as you were saying, you know, there's there's concern that moving somebody too much might injure them. Correct. And so he he didn't move her very much, or at all. He just kind of gently nudges her on her back, right? Correct. And his left hand is ungloved. Correct. So just so it's very clear, uh, he doesn't roll her over. Right, he's already stated all of that, Council. Okay. <coughs> now, I have what I like to mark as defense uh, PP 1 through 12 and these are um, body worn snaps like a snapshots of body worn video. All right. May I approach? Yes. Are you going to publish them first or what are you not? I'm going to lay foundation first. Okay. And then uh -huh. to publish. Can you please look at these 12? Uh, May I approach on it? Yes, first. <coughs> Once you get okay. there, you can look at them just so that you can see them. Approach? Yes, I, I haven't seen these. These are just these are just video snapshots. So you're asking if he recognizes them? Exactly, exactly. <coughs> Please review these and uh, look up when you review them, please. Now, you saw Miss Harwick in the patio when you came around the corner that night. Did right? he answer? You recognized him? Uh, if he did, I didn't answer. I didn't hear it. I have an estimate. Okay, go ahead. You saw Miss Harwick when you came around the corner <coughs> to the patio that night, right? Yes. And are these uh, defense PP 1 through 12, are these accurate uh, depictions of the way she appeared when you first saw her? Yes. Yes, sir. 
and there's blood that is beneath her head, right? Yes. And uh, the timestamp on this uh, <coughs> screenshot is 1.33 and 43 seconds, right? Yes. And you first came around the corner into the patio at 1.30, approximately three minutes before that. Yes. Publishing uh, Defense PP6. Now, this is, first of all, the light and the reflection is awful. There. Oh, there we go. It's a little better. So this is a very dark photograph, and it's kind of hard to make out um, exactly what's going on. But this is um, another angle of Miss Harwick on the patio, right? Yes. And again, this is how she appeared to you when you first encountered her. Yes. Publishing Defense PP5. <coughs> um, let's see if I can get the glare to not be so bad. Now, this is um, Officer Edney's ungloved right hand holding something, right? Yes. Publishing Defense PP4. This is just a different angle of her in the patio as you encounter it, correct? Yes. And this is from right, you know, under a minute after you round the bend. So this is at 1.30 and 52 seconds, right? Yes. Publishing Defense PP3. Uh, this is from <coughs> 1.30 and 38 seconds, and this is how she appeared as you approached her um, right after coming around the corner of the house, right? Yes. And that's Michael Herman uh, in front of you, right? Uh, yes, it is. Publishing Defense TV1. This is just a screenshot from eight seconds earlier another angle of how she appeared to you as you were uh, first approached. Yes, that correct. Did we get a response? Yes, the, okay. ans the response was yes. Thank you. So all of the uh, screenshots I, I showed you, actually you're, you've already asked or answered that question. <coughs> So once you see Ms. Harwick on the patio and talk to Mr. Herman, you decided you needed to clear the house. Yes. And the goal of clearing the house is to make sure that there's no one inside. Correct. Um, your top priority at that time, you know, within minutes of arriving, is to make sure that uh, it's safe there. Yes. Uh, you want to make sure there's no threat to responding officers. Correct. You want to make sure that there's no threat to the paramedics who were about to be on their way? Yes, sir. Redundant. Redundant? Well, I mean, repetitive and asked an answer. Well, I think he's, he's naming different personnel and different reasons, so I'll, I'll go ahead and allow it, give him some leeway a little bit. But <clears throat> so just the, the point is that when you're, when you're going to go clear the house, the, the goal for you is, is safety. Yes, it is. Um, however, from the very beginning, you felt like there was something off with the situation, right? Yes. Uh, you saw the blood on Mr. Herman's shirt. Yes. And you felt that there was, there was something potentially going on, right? Yes. <clears throat> so let's talk about clearing the house. And I'm not going to go through the whole video again. I'm just going to highlight a couple moments. So first, Officer Edney goes into Mr. Herman's room, right? Yes. He finds his keys. Yes. Um, officer Edney then goes around the side of the house to open the gate for the other officers who were going to come. 
I believe so, yes. Uh, so you first, the first place you clear is that ground floor that had Mr. Herman's bedroom. Yes. You had a flashlight in your hand. Yes. Uh, you first clear that ground floor and then you go back out to the patio, right? Yes. But then you do a call out into the house to see if anyone's there. Yes. And uh, a call out is when you say, you know, LAPD, come out with your hands up. And give, if there is somebody inside, give them a chance to surrender. Correct. So I'm now going to uh, People's Exhibit, I believe it's 28. I'm going back to People's Exhibit 28. <coughs> Timestamp 8.50. Hey, somebody. Hitting pause at, uh, at 8.53. So at about 1.33 in the morning, um, the other officers arrive, right? Yes. And you were standing outside of Mr. Herman's room, and you heard, you heard voices, but you couldn't sure if it was just the TV that was on or not. Right? Correct. Um, you make a plan with the other responding officers. Yes. Um, the other officers who were assisting you clearing the house were Officer Sweeney. Correct. Podkowski. Podkowski, yes. Oh, sorry. Podkowski. Edney. Yes. Cornejo. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with any. <laughs> so. Um, in total, there were four officers who took part initially in clearing the house. Yes. Going to timestamp 944 and hitting play. These two rooms are clear already. I hear voices, but I can't feel So you first enter the house around hitting pause at 951. You first enter the house. Um, around one th or at one thirty four a.m. Sorry, you first go upstairs at one thirty four a.m. Right? Yes. And that's um, about four minutes after arriving uh, at the patio. Correct. <laughs> now the first thing you do is you clear the kitchen. Right. Well, uh, we clear we clear the downstairs first. I'd like to go to timestamp 10.06. You cover this. Um, and I'm hitting pause at 10.07. So your left hand there at, uh, at this point in time does not have a glove on it, correct? Correct. Hitting play at 10.07. Okay, you, cover, you cover straight ahead. Got it? Got it. I'm going. Hey, be advised, there's a, there's a lot of dummies. All right, let's clear this. Hey, uh, Cornell, come with us, dude. You guys, you guys hold that, okay? Or Pop Cassie, you hold that? Sweetie, come. Hitting pause at 10.30. Um, you, you mentioned another officer, Cord Cord Cordero? Cordero, that's uh, Officer Sweeney's first name. That's Officer Sweeney's first name? Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break, if you would, please.
back on the record in this matter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, we're going to stop at 3 o'clock today. I'm, I'm struggling up here to keep from coughing, um, but I'll, I'll be here tomorrow uh, and, and so forth. But in spite of the interruptions that have occurred in this case due to illnesses and so forth, um, we're still on track. As I stated, that the forecast is that the prosecution intends to rest sometime around Monday, okay, and we'll move forward from there. Uh, you may continue your examination, Counselor. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. Okay, so the, your body worn is paused at uh, 1007, and your left hand is in the screen there. At this time, it does not have a glove, right? Correct. All right, I'd like to jump forward to uh, 1045 and hit play. It loops around. It's going to go down to the staircase. It goes out back outside. Back down to that. Hitting pause at 1057. So that's you pushing the door open with your left hand to the kitchen, right? Correct. I'd like to jump forward to 1226. Actually, 1222. So this is um, you and the other officers about to clear the third floor, right? Yes. And is that, uh, which officer is that who's at the, in the lead there with his left foot on the step? It's Officer Podkowski. Right. So that's Officer Podkowski, and you can see that he doesn't have gloves on, right? Correct. Officer Sweeney. And this is you pushing the door open, right? Yes. Hitting pause at 12.30. Um, so this is uh, pushing the door open with your left hand and pulling the shower curtain with your left hand back, right? Yes. I'd like to go to 13.15. Now, this is inside of the closet that's off of Ms. Harwick's bedroom, right? Yes. Hitting play. This place is fucking weird. That's super nice. Alright, hitting pause there at 1321. So that was um, one of the officers touching the uh, drawer in her closet with an ungloved hand. I believe so, yes. Now, you go out to the balcony. I'm going to jump. Actually, I'll just hit play here. It's clear here. <coughs> you see it? Okay, hitting pause. So, you go out to the balcony. Um, this is the first time that you go out to the balcony at about 1.37 and 50 seconds, right? Yes. Um, going to 14.30... This is uh, you going out to the balcony a second time, right? Yes. Hitting play. See this, dude. Oh, dude. So. Yeah. It's a cool four for now, sir. Okay, so at um, hitting pause at 1450, uh, you announced to Sergeant Deneen, uh, to code four, sir, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Code four means uh, that it's clear. Correct. Um, once you announce, and so that would be at 139 and 11 seconds, right? <coughs> yes. And after you announce code four, uh, you continue looking around the rooms of the house, right? Yes. Jumping forward to 1620, actually 1618. So this is you going out to the balcony a third time, right? Yes.
Now, um, once the house is clear, you go back uh, downstairs to the patio, right? Yes. Um, and then you realize that you should probably get Miss Harwick's ID, so you go back upstairs to look for her identification, right? Yes. And at that point, other officers had opened the front door, right? Yes. So going to 23, timestamp 2340. Hitting play at 2338. Okay, so the tw hitting pause at 2347. Uh, this is you looking for her identification, right? Yes. Hitting play. <laughs> All right. Hitting pause at 2402. Um, so you're looking for her identification with an ungloved hand at that time, right? Yes. Going to timestamp 30, 10. Possibly, he didn't conclusively state that it was. Uh, now you, you did hear the sound. Yes, sir, I did. Okay, it'll stand. And you and you <coughs> saw you saw what you previously described as uh, beads, I believe, right? Yes, sir. And based on what you saw, the beads to be made out of, they could have made that sound if you or Officer Eddie had like kicked it into, into the molding or something. Calling like for speculation. Sustain. Let me phrase your question. <clears throat> I think I think I I don't need to. Okay. Oh, um, now, in that exchange that we just listened to between you and Officer Edney, um, you said that the, the substance you saw on the ground was urine, right? Yes. And Officer Edney isn't sure, right? Uh, he doesn't appear to be sure. Going to thirty one twenty.
Surmising that, sir? You speculating? Is that cor- or do you know for a fact? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Okay, then I will. I will sustain the objection. To the best of your knowledge, but you can't say conclusively for sure. Correct, sir. All right. <coughs> do you have a cell phone? I do. Do you get push notifications from apps? Relevance. Well, he's trying to lay a foundation. I take it. Perhaps. 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 Yes. Well, let's strike the word perhaps. Go ahead. I mean, yes. <coughs> this is a basic. Uh, are you, sir, are you familiar with what a push notification is? Yes. Okay. So, um, now, uh, push notifications will appear in a scrolling fashion. So if many are coming in, you only see the most recent ones. My objection was referring to Nest app, not all apps, just the focus is on the Nest app. Okay. Well, this is just how push notifications work on the phone. Okay. Do I'll allow it. Go ahead. Do you know? Can you answer? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Push notifications will a- appear in a scrolling fashion. So if there are multiple over time, you'll only see the most recent ones. Most of the time, yes. Most of the time. Are there other occasions where it does that where that does not happen? Um under uh customization I, I, I would imagine you could do you could change the uh uh, status of how the push notifications appear. I I, I don't know any of that, so <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. All right. Um, I'll move on. All right. Uh, going to timestamp thirty two forty two. Hitting play. So hitting pause at thirty two forty seven. Uh, this is you going out to the balcony at fourth time. Yes. Hitting play. Yes, Aaron. Yeah. It's a little weird at first. That's fully loaded. Look at another one. Another one with black beads. These beads are here from the inside. This is from the OP. Hitting pause at 33.11. Uh, this is Officer Edney grabbing the railing with an ungloved right hand. Right? Yes. Going to timestamp 3410. 3407, actually. Probably. You could call that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that just it just felt weird, you know. Hitting pause at 3434. So that's Officer Edney looking through her purse um, with one, one gloved hand and one un, ungloved hand. All right? Yes. Going to 3828. 3827 to be exact. Do we clear all this? Yeah, we do. Hitting pause at 3835. That's Officer Edney opening up a, a cabinet door with an ungloved right hand, right? Yes. Going to 3905. Not 3901, actually. Okay. Are you cheating me with this stupid thing? Hey, what's hitting pause at 3912? That's Officer Edney saying, I just kicked a bee. Right? Yes. Going to minute 43. So that's looking at the still image uh, at 4250. That's up to the place, right? Yes. So at about um, that would be two, oh, uh, about, roughly speaking, to around 2 a.m., Officer Garcia and Robles arrive, right? Correct. Hitting play at 4250. How long she's going to be in there? Hitting pause at 4305. And so after they arrived, Officer Garcia and Robles went upstairs to check out the house, right? <coughs> I don't recall if they did or not. Um, now, Officer Sweeney was supposed to accompany the paramedics to in, in the ambulance to Cedar Sinai, right? Uh, either him or his partner were supposed to. But both of them forgot, right? Uh, I don't believe so. I believe uh, Officer Podkowski did uh, go with the ambulance. All right, going to timestamp 50. from the Homicide Bureau arriving, um, you and Officer Edney walked around the house multiple times, right? Yes. Officer, same for Officer Sweeney and Podkowski. Yes. Um, same for Officers Garcia and Robles, right? I don't recall if they walked through the whole house. Um, same for Officers Rendon and Grossman. I think it's the same. Uh, the that, that they walked through the house? You're talking about a walkthrough? Yes. I don't recall if they walked through the house. <coughs> Uh, Officer Delavant, Delavant. Yes. He also, he or she actually, I don't know. Uh, he he walked through the house, yes. And Sergeant Deneen also <coughs> uh, walked through the house, right? I don't recall if Sergeant Deneen walked <coughs> through the house. And these uh, going through the house and searching the house, this all occurred after the code four had been announced, right? Yes. Now. From the from the very moment you arrived, you you thought the situation was was kind of off, right? Yes. You didn't believe Mr. Herman's story. I believed his story. Didn't you think he was a suspect? 
I, I wasn't aware of, of who was a suspect or who was a victim. Well, at the at minimum, you thought there possibly could be foul play, right? Correct. So now, when there is a potential crime scene, it's in, it's important to hold that crime scene, right? Yes. And that means that the officer holds the scene to make sure that no one enters or exits. Yes. Um, if people do enter or exit a crime scene, they can accidentally taint evidence. Possibly. Um, part of holding a crime scene can be creating a crime scene log, right? Yes. And that's a document that lists who entered the crime scene and when they entered, right? Yes. Um, and there's an LAPD form for a crime scene log, and that form includes options to delineate whether it's an exterior or interior crime scene log, right? Yes. Now, in this case, Officer Grossman was the officer who originated the crime scene log. Right? I don't recall. Would you refresh your recollection to look at the crime scene log? Uh, yes. So, if you could look at uh, page one, right there, and okay. this for that, mm -hmm. and then page two, exterior. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, uh, did that refresh your recollection, sir? It did. Uh, so, for the interior crime scene, uh, Officer Grossman originated. Yes. And for the exterior crime scene, log <coughs> Officer Garcia. Uh, originated it. Yes. And uh, d when I showed you these crime scene logs, did you rec uh, did you rec did you um, know what they were? Yes. I'd like to mark them as defense. Double Q. Q Q. <coughs> and I I'll just for the sake of efficiency, I'll just make all of the pages one exhibit. All right. And so this is a four. Four page exhibit showing it to the people. Okay. Just to get a, a, a sense. Um. Um, I'm not going to admit it, but I'm yeah. going to ask you questions. Are you going to mark it? Or you no, want your client? I think okay. it should be marked at this point. Well, why don't you just mark it? It's up to you if you admit it at the end. If you seek to admit it. We, don't, we haven't reached that point yet. Okay. All right. Well, uh, just out of, out of time-wise, how much longer do you have with this witness? Not very long. Okay. okay. Just. Well, it definitely be done by lunch. All right. So this is uh, QQ, right? Yes. Double double Q. Um, so you did recognize this crime scene log, right? Yes. Um, and let's talk about the interior crime scene log. So the earliest time that is marked for any uh, employee of law enforcement arriving is five in the morning, right? I believe so. All right. Uh, all of the officers that we were just discussing, including yourself, do not appear on this interior crime scene law prior to 5 a.m., right? I don't have one in front of me. Would it help to look at it? Yes. Look up when you're done, please. Just for the interior, correct? Correct. That's, that's correct, yes, sir. So prior to 5 a.m., all of the foot traffic in and out of the house, which did also include um, staff from the fire department, um, none of that is reflected in the interior crime scene log. Is that true? Yes. Just a compound. Oh. Um, I don't know. Is it yes to everything? I'm sorry, sir? Is it yes to, what, to, to the questions that you posed? Uh, neither of those, uh, the, the officers nor the uh, fire department okay. was listed on the... All right. Um, after you cleared the house, uh, well, actually, multiple times throughout the night, you and your partner spoke with Michael Herman, right? Yes. And you asked him what happened? Yes. Um, you, ap you asked him what happened in, in multiple different moments, um, including when you first arrived, right? Yes. Um, after the paramedics arrived? Yes. Um, 
So in other words, you took uh, multiple statements from him throughout the night, right? Yes. And he never told you he heard sounds of choking, right? Not to my recollection. He uh, never told you that he heard profuse coughing, right? Not to my recollection. You would have included both of those in your report had he told you that. Yes. He also said that Miss Harwick was yelling the entire time uh, through the moment that he left the house to go out to the street, right? Uh, he told me she was screaming. Um, you do not have any formal medical uh, training or background other than what you receive as um, part of the academy and part of being a police officer, right? Correct. Um, in your report um, for this case, isn't it true that when describing what your partner did, Officer Edney, when he first went up to Miss Harwood, you wrote that he uh, touched her with a gloved hand, right? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. And upon reviewing your body worn video, <coughs> isn't it true that his hand was ungloved when he touched her? Yes. Nothing further. Hey. Yes. Uh, is the body worn video, is that the best evidence of your interaction with Michael Herman? Yes. Okay, so whatever discussion you had with Michael Herman, it's on the body worn video. Correct. The questions you posed to him, he answered. Yes. Questions that you didn't post to him, he didn't answer. Correct. And now, you get the call. According to People's Exhibit Number 16, the 911 log, do you get it sometime around 1.14 in the morning? Yes, sir. And then, according to the body worn video, uh, you arrive at about 1.30 uh, in the morning. Correct. Can I have those pictures? Yes, sir. So, while we're getting that, um, did anything significant happen by the time between the time you left the police station to the time that you got to the location where this to this crime scene? Uh, yes, I believe so. What happened? Um, Amy Hart Amy Hartwick was attacked. Well, no, not that. I'm asking you about things you know, like on your on your drive to. Uh, 2086, did anything happen? The, the video that we were just shown, the, the five minutes of you driving over there, did anything significant happen in that part? Uh, we got lost. Okay. Other than that, anything else? No. Let me just show one. This is a um, defense video still. PP double. Double P what? Double, uh, double P eleven. All right. All right. You see the timestamp on that video still of nine forty-two. <coughs> I mean, uh, one that would be one forty-two in the morning, correct? Yes. All right. But you see, you see her body for the first time around one thirty a.m. Yes. Okay. So, so you, you get the call at one fourteen a.m. and you see her body for the first time at one thirty a.m. Yes, sir. It's like a fourteen fifteen minute gap. Yes, sir. Do you know what the position of her body was before you saw her? No. Now, counsel showed you a, a <coughs> clip from uh, Officer Edney's body-worn video. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Where he appears to touch it. Uh, do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you remember what part of her body he touched? Uh, her middle back. Okay. Was there any blood on her middle back? No. Uh, how long did he touch her for? Uh, less than a second. So for less than a second he touches her on a part where you didn't see any blood? Correct. Did he say, I got blood in my fingers? No. Did you see any blood on his fingers? No. So the video clip counsel showed you uh, he only touched her for about one second. 
Correct. And he touched her on a part, uh, which part again of the body? Uh, her lower to middle back. Was there a dress at that, in that, on that part? Yes. And did you see any blood on that dress? No. Now, are you requ when, when you get to a crime scene like this, uh, are you supposed to clear the house first, or are you supposed to hold it to make sure you start a log and start checking people in as who arrive at the crime scene? Clear the house first, sir. Why is that? Uh, to deem it safe for everyone involved. And was that your priority on this occasion? It was. Are you required to wear gloves when you're clearing a house? No. Why not? Because of the exigency of uh, uh, suspects or other victims inside the house. Okay. Would it be good practice to wear gloves? Yes. Okay. Well, why didn't you wear gloves on this occasion? Uh, again, just because of the exigency, um, and we wanted to deem it safe for the ambulance that was on their way, as well as uh, uh, officers that were en route to the location as well. So when you arrived at the crime scene, did you know that the suspect, who, whoever may have been involved with this, do you, do you know whether he was still in the house or not? Uh, no. Now, all these officers, like Officer uh, Edney, he had his own body-worn camera. He did. And Sergeant Deneen had body-worn video. Yes. And the other officers had body-worn video. Yes. So, so uh, if you have access to this body-worn video, you could see what they're touching and where they're going. Correct. Now, counsel showed you a internal log, the log for people coming into the house. Did you write that log? No. Do you know why the person that wrote that log wrote it the way he did, saying that people were coming in at 5 a.m.? No. Is the log started after detectives get involved, to your knowledge? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yes. And you were, you and your partner, Officer Eddie, were the first to arrive at this crime scene? Correct. And then counsel showed you a part of the video where you approach the kitchen. Do you remember that? Yes. And he asked you, you opened the kitchen door. Do you remember him asking you that? Yes. And just to be clear, uh, was the kitchen door already open when you got to the kitchen? It was already open. Okay. So you just pushed it further open? Correct. And did you know the Nest app settings for this particular phone that was on the bed? No. Do you know what it was recording? No. Do you know what kind of... Uh, Subscription the person had on this? No. And when you first, and I, I, I'm not sure if I already asked you this, but when you first came into the house, you jumped over that iron gate landed in that front patio. Uh, did you see the damage to those French doors that lead into the living room? No, I did not.
30 and 52 seconds, right? Yes. So this position is how you encountered her uh, in the patio, right? Yes. And so when you testified on direct, um, you testified the other day that her head was tilted to the left, her head was kind of tucked under her left shoulder. So that you that was a mistake that you misremembered where the direction her head was facing, right? Her head was her her head was facing to the right over her right shoulder, right? That's correct. And it wasn't and her, her chin was slightly up, it wasn't tucked under the left shoulder. Correct. <coughs> Nothing further. Anything based on those questions? Just why uh, why do you keep going into the house uh, after the initial time that you, you went into the house? Objection outside the scope. Allow the answer. Um, we continue to enter the house to look for further evidence of um, either what we initially believed to be an overdose or um, uh, what we also believe to be a possible suicide or lastly uh, any other evidence of, of a possible uh, uh, further crime or uh, of a murder. Are you still trying to figure things out as you're there? Yes, sir. And are you still going in there to try to figure things out? Yes, sir. I have nothing further. Okay. All right, you may step down. Thank you, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and break for lunch. You would have a good lunch. We'll see you at one three. Remember, it's till 3 o'clock today. Thank you. Record in this matter, uh, people you may call your next witness. Yes, people call Dr. Alan Wu to the stand. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember. <coughs> you could raise your right hand. Can you saw me state that the testimony you're about to give is before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help God. I do swear. Thank you. Please have a seat. Please state and spell both your first and last name. Alan Wu, A-L-A-N-W-U. All right, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, please tell the jury what it is that you do for a living. I am a professor of laboratory medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and I am one of the laboratory directors at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And can you briefly describe your education uh, for this position? I have uh, bachelor's degrees in uh, chemistry and biology, a doctoral degree, PhD degree from the uh, University of Illinois in analytical chemistry and postdoctoral training in clinical chemistry. Can you briefly describe your training experience in chemistry? Well, I'm trained to operate clinical laboratories in hospitals and medical centers. And how many years have you been doing that? 41. And are you the chief at clinical chemistry toxicology laboratories of San Francisco General Hospital? Now called the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, yes.
And do you hold any licenses or certifications? I'm licensed by the American Board of Clinical Chemistry in both clinical chemistry and toxicological chemistry and by the state of California for uh, clinical chemistry. Since when? My American Board licensure dates to 1982 and 1983, and my California license dates to 2005, the year that uh, the year after I arrived in California. And do you hold any positions uh, in any advisory committees? I am a member of the Medical Advisory Committee for the Northern California Poison Control Center. What, what does that entail, being a member of that committee? Um, it is a, an advisory committee for the Poison Center itself who receives calls and cases from families, from doctors, from nurses about patients and subjects who have been exposed to uh, poisons and toxicological substances. And is your laboratory accredited? Yes. Uh, accredited so far as what? It is accredited by the uh, Health and Human Services uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid as a high complexity clinical laboratory. What does that, that mean, high complexity clinical laboratory? What is the highest level of, of certification that uh, HHS um, <clears throat> uh, grants? It allows us to do testing that is above and beyond uh, automated procedures. And back in May of 2002, uh, did LAPD detectives uh, contact you to conduct analysis on, an, on, a, on what they believe was nicotine? Yes. And did they ask you uh, whether you can determine uh, the quantity of nicotine, the purity of nicotine in that vial? Yes. And did you indicate that you could do that? Yes. And how would you be able to do that? We use uh, instrumentation that allows us to quantitate levels of, of drugs, poisons, and toxins, and chemicals um, found in various fluids. And what type of instruments do you use to do that? In our particular uh, situation, we use high-resolution, time-of-flight, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. And is that a generally accepted method of using that instrument uh, to conduct that type of analysis? Um, you need to clarify what type of analysis are you referring to? Uh, for the purity of, of the nicotine. Um, we use this instrument for medical purposes. We test blood, urine, other types of biological fluids. We have also used it to determine purity, but that is not what we normally do. But you're able to do it? Yes. And prior to your analysis, did you receive uh, from the prosecution uh, reports from a Dr. Maureen Bradley? I did. Okay. And these are reports related to her analysis uh, back in August of uh, 25th, 2020. Is that correct? Yes, I, I believe that Dr. Bradley uh, was a, or is a, uh, a, a, an analyst at the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia. Okay. And you read her notes on her analysis of the liquid? I, you can answer that. Yes, I did. Including that she determined that the liquid was nicotine. That is correct. He's testifying as an expert in this uh, category, in this field, a lot. You can rely on reports and hearsay. And you took that into consideration for your analysis, too? Yes, I read her reports, and we followed some of the procedures that she used in generating her report two years earlier. And sometime around May, around May 2nd, 2002, did you receive... Uh, an item 66, uh, two vials. Yes. Did you take a picture of the envelope of item number 66? Yes. 
Uh, actually, I actually have one page photograph and just remind people's next in order, people's number. 60. 60? Yes. <coughs> Can hear at people 60. Do you see that photograph? Uh, yes, I do. Did you take that photograph? Yes. Okay. And the number 66 for the item number? It's not well written. Um, the first six is could be construed as uh, an eight, but uh, I believe with other documents that that is number 66. Okay. And it's uh, a package with the name Amy Harwick and a DR number of 2006-06220. Correct. Now, when you received these two vials, you didn't know where these vials came from? Well, I knew they came from, ultimately, the, uh, uh, the laboratory at Quantico um, that had been sent to the LAPD um, evidence um, desk. Don't know the official name. So it ultimately came from the LAPD, but I think the origin was the Quantico Laboratory. Yes, and that's based on your review of Dr. Bradley's notes. That's correct. Okay. And so you received these two vials for item 66, and you tested them. I did. And we how did. did you test them? Using the aforementioned instrumentation. And what did you determine as far as item 66? There was no compounds of interest found in it. It appeared to be just a perhaps liquid water. There was nothing in it. Okay. And did you contact LAPD to let them know that? I did. And did they send you something else? Well, we had a conversation, and um, <clears throat> I believe one of the people I spoke to was, uh, was an officer, Masterson. Detective Masterson? Yes. Okay. And uh, he went through the records and concluded that the LAPD evidence office had sent the wrong vial. Did they then send you the vials for item 21? They did. And did you take photographs of that package? Yes. Look, you want to have a, another series of photographs, A through D, and this DMARC has people's number 61? Yes. Looking at 61, A, do you recognize what's shown there? It's a photograph that I took. And this is for a package with an item 21? It's correct, it's listed in two places, the one just to the left also says item and then it says 35 crossed out and some date and initial the best I can see and then written to the right of that is again item to, uh, number 21. Now did you receive this package sometime around July 11th 2002? Yes that would be roughly two months after I received item number 66 through the same um, LAPD. And do you see this number here, the sticker on People's 61A, where it's, uh, it's a sticker that has the labeling packaging A1 2020-00954 number one? I see that. Okay, is that a lab report number for the FBI that was used by Dr. Bradley in analyzing a liquid from a syringe that was provided to her? I believe so. I compared her notes, handwritten notes, as well as the written report uh, on the, her analysis of this material, and th those numbers appear to agree. Looking at page B of this exhibit, did you take photographs of the contents of that envelope that we just showed the jury? Yes. Can you tell us what is shown here? Well, um, there's two things in this particular photograph. One is an outer um, envelope, or rather outer sleeve, which, which um, at when I received the evidence contained the syringe inside the sleeve. I opened it, documented uh, that I had done this, pulled it out so that I could show what the syringe looked like, and then took a picture of both the syringe and the outer cover. And looking at photograph C, is this a close-up of that syringe? It is the same syringe and outer casing with the syringe inside. And was there also a vial in that package? There, there was. And did you take a photograph of that? I did. And that, is that here on people's uh, photograph D of this exhibit? Yes, it is. And turn this around. 
zooming in on the labeling on the vial on photograph D. Does that have uh, the FBI uh, lab number 2020 00954 and then item one on the vial? So I can ascertain the photo is a little bit um, uh, illegible with the second digit of the zero zero. That is, in fact, the second digit. It is 2020 00954. And then the first word underneath is the word item. The letter I is a little bit obscured because of the angle that the photograph was taken. But I can assure you, or I can ascertain, that this, in fact, was labeled item one. Okay. And this is the item one as labeled in Dr. Bradley's notes for what she generated. Correct. So, uh, what exactly did you test at this point at your laboratory? The contents of that file. And how did you do that? We took out a small amount of the contents of that file for your syringe. We put it onto a, a balance, um, a weighing device. We determined how much we um, withdrew, approximately 100 microliters, weighed it, and then um, from that point on, performed the analysis. And can you just briefly explain to the jury what is that analysis? What does that analysis entail? Well, the first thing that we have to do is to dilute the sample because our instruments are highly sensitive. We can see uh, specks full of drugs that can't be seen by the visible eye. If you're going to take 100 microliters of what we thought was a reasonably pure material, this would have overloaded our instrument by a million fold. So we had to dilute the liquid content that we obtained from that vial in two serial dilutions to the extent that it was diluted one million fold, <coughs> 10 to the sixth. And what was the result of that? I'm sorry, what was the result of the dilution? What was the result of your analysis? <laughs> well, that was just the preparatory analysis. We then had to um, do the instrumentation analysis, which consisted of first ensuring that the instrument was correctly um, calibrated um, with uh, known standards, um, making sure that the instrument was clean, that there was the necessarily quality controls that we put in there to demonstrate that the instrument was operational. We determined that there was no carryover from any existing samples. <clears throat> so the first step prior to touching anything from this evidence was to calibrate the instrument. And was that done? Yes. And you said you used a standard. What do you mean by that? A standard is a material that we purchase that is certified by the manufacturer of that material to be what it, what it says it to be, as well as the content and purity of the standard itself. So these are things that are documented prior to us using them. Okay. And what standard did you use in this case? Nicotine. At what purity level? The purity level uh, indicated by the manufacturer was greater than 99.9%. .9%. And did you, uh, as, as an expert, did you believe that to be reliable, that it was, that the standard was 99% pure nicotine? We don't verify the purity, that's beyond the scope of our work, but we've never had an issue with a substandard material. And then, did you continue your analysis? Once the instrument was calibrated, I might mention that this is a step that the FBI lab does not do, which was the reason that we were engaged in this work. They do not do quantitative analysis. And so we were asked to provide a quantitative analysis of the content in item number one. It was required that we calibrate the instrument. <coughs> Once the instrument was calibrated to our satisfaction, we injected the sample. Okay. And then what happened? Once the result has been uh, completed, which takes about an hour, all told, including the calibration, we look at the instrument printouts and we evaluate the contents um, for two things. Number one, what is it? 
and what degree of confidence do we have that it is um, what we think it is, i.e. nicotine. So before doing any type of calculation, we wanted to be sure that we were dealing with, in fact, the chemical in question, because had it not been the chemical in question, such as what we saw for item number 66, there was no point going any further. And what did the uh, printouts show you on this occasion? We were able to demonstrate that this material was, in fact, nicotine to above the uh, <clears throat> acceptance criteria that we have in the laboratory for this, uh, for this compound. Okay, and did you uh, retain records of these printouts? Yes. Okay. And were those included with your report? No. They were not? And what else did the analysis show you as far as purity? Well, so after we've uh, ascertained that, in fact, the material that we were looking at was, in fact, nicotine, we um, determined the purity of that material by comparing it, by first determining the concentration of the material that we injected into our instrument, compared it to our calibration curve, came up with a concentration, back calculated to the amount of material that we took originally uh, from the uh, balance, and, uh, and did a calculation. And what was the result of that calculation? It rounded up to 87% pure. Pure nicotine? Yes. Is nicotine at that purity level, is that a poison? Based on your training experience, are you able to answer that question? Yes. Okay, you may. And the answer is yes. Um, that high of a concentration is uh, beyond what you would ever expect to see in a cigarette or in a smokeless tobacco or any other nicotine product. Uh, this is um, highly poisonous, in my opinion. And did you document your findings in a report? Yes. And did you date that report August 8th, 2022? Yes. Did you include pictures of the instrument used? Don't believe so. Uh, did you include uh, graphs uh, for the calibration curve of the yes. nicotine standard? Yes. Now, is your laboratory accredited to run purity uh, exams analysis? No. Uh, why not? As I testified earlier, the purpose of my uh, laboratory is to provide uh, qualitative, which means unknown analysis, as well as quantitative, uh, in other words, how much of uh, drugs, chemicals, and substances in biological fluids. We uh, don't generally do purity analysis, but we have done so in other cases for various medical reasons. Does the fact that you don't have an, well, first of all, is it, is there more stringent accreditation to do the analysis that you do do on uh, organic and tissue? Objection foundation speculation. Not Again, I, I, board. are you able to answer that based on your training experience? Yes. Even though that your lab is not accredited? Yes. With respect to period. Okay, you may. I am familiar with the standards necessary to, to get accreditation for forensic purposes. I have been part of other laboratories that have had forensic certification. Uh, the standards for medical certification, in my opinion, are higher. That uh, we do more things to verify the accuracy of the tests that we provide than does a forensic laboratory. And the difference being that in a forensic environment that you're dealing with uh, legal issues by definition, forensic means uh, legal proceedings, in a clinical environment, the results of our testing are used to make medical decisions. Medical decisions that can affect a person's life, that can affect their, uh, in fact, their survival. And if we get the information wrong by providing the incorrect medical decisions, people could be uh, unduly harmed. So the fact that you don't have an accreditation to conduct this type of uh, forensic analysis uh, does that affect the accuracy of your results in any way? We use the exact same procedures as accredited forensic laboratories, whether they be in the um, medical examiner's office 
or a FBI laboratory, the methodologies are the same, the principles are the same. We just uh, only sought certification for clinical testing. And is, what is your fee uh, to work on a case like this, an hourly, your hourly rate? Well, there is a fee for conducting the analyses, which is separate from what I'm doing now. Um, my expert testimony and opinions on this case, I charge $400 an hour. And about how many hours are you gonna, have you been involved in this particular case? 10. And that's dating back, dating back to uh, May of 2002, 2022. Yes. Just, just for clarity, you, you charge uh, $400 for testimony? Testimony, preparing reports, reviewing records, reviewing okay. depositions, telephone calls, anything related to this case. The same rate? Same, same rate as your testimony? Correct. Okay. I don't right. differentiate. Understood. And did, did you, were you also provided with Dr. Bradley's preliminary hearing testimony? Yes. And did you also review that? Several times. May I have one moment, Your Honor? Yes. In her preliminary hearing testimony for Dr. Maureen Bradley, did you know that she gave an opinion that she believed that based on her using a 99% standard that the liquid that she tested was approximately 90 to 100%? That she said that you can infer from that, that it has a purity of, say, approximately 90 to 100 percent. I did read that. And uh, what is your opinion of, of that opinion? I mean, it, 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 this witness testified to uh, 87 percent purity versus uh, what, uh, uh, is it Dr. Bradley? Dr. Maureen Bradley. Bradley's uh, figures were, so I'll allow him to explain. You can so a any analytical measurement has error limits. Nothing is absolute. <clears throat> there are a range of values that this number could be. <clears throat> and I estimate it to be a few percent, three to five percent. <clears throat> Excuse me. So your results could be, the purity uh, of the liquid you tested could be off by three to five percent. Correct. And uh, if you add it to that 87 percent, it does concur with Dr. Bradley's conclusion. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Cross-examination. <coughs> yes. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Abu. You were asked in this case to test the sample for the purity of nicotine, right? Yes. And um, <coughs> do you have water there? Um, okay, good. All right. I'll give you a second. Thank you for asking. Well, I can relate. Please. I don't have COVID. <laughs> and I know I'm a doctor. Um, thank you. Uh, you were not asked to test the sample to identify all compounds in the sample. Correct. Um, your analysis revealed nicotine as the major compound. Yes. And there were other compounds present that were not the major compound. No. There was not cottonine? No. It was, it may have been present, but it was present perhaps in a, a trace amount. It's not a major component, no. No, my question was, there were other compounds present that were not the major component. Uh, there may have been, but we were not asked to look for them. Right, that's all I'm asking. Sorry. So no, I'm, I'm sure my, my question was probably poorly phrased. Um, now, gas chromatography mass spectrometry is a generally accepted method for identifying substances. 
Yes. And it's an incredibly reliable method if done well. Yes. Um, you... Did you ever speak about your... about the facts of your work um, with either of the, the prosecuting attorneys, Ms. Mariano or Mr. Avila, over the phone, or was it all via email? Over the phone with, uh, with uh, Mr. Avila. Okay. Um, do you recall when that was? <clears throat> this morning, um, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, multiple occasions. Okay. Do you recall if any of those conversations were recorded? I don't believe they were recorded, no. Um, in your report, you indicated that the total volume um, of solution that you extracted was uh, determined by a micropipette. Yes. Um, and that's the instrument, a micropipette is the instrument you use to pull the liquid from the vial, right? Yes. It's also the instrument that allows you to measure it, right? Well, in this case, it was used to just extract it because we ended up putting it onto a vial that was pre-weighed when empty and weighed it. So we actually didn't use the volume taken, we used the weight. You, um, you were CC'd on emails between Dr. Benowitz and, the, and Mr. Avila, right? Only initially, um, when Dr. Benowitz recommended me in my lab to participate in this case, or invited me to, to consider participating, those were the only emails that I, I had with him. You were aware of the, the role that your analysis would play in this case, though? Vague as to the role his analysis yeah, would play? It's the state. Let's clean that up if you were careful. You were aware that uh, Dr. Benowitz would rely on your work on the purity for him to form an opinion? Um, <clears throat> I didn't know the circumstances of the case. Didn't know who the defendant was or who the victim was. All I know was that this was a case of a um, nicotine um, analysis, and the circumstances surrounding the case were never made known to me. You were aware that Dr. Benowitz was attached to the case in some way? Yes, I did know that. He was the one who referred the DA to me. And that he would <clears throat> review your work in, in preparing for his own testimony? I don't know if he ever reviewed my work. I've never had a discussion with him, and I see him every two weeks. Um, to, included in your compensation, did, does that include travel? Um, this is the only travel, and I have yet to invoice for the travel, so it does not. Will that be part of it? Yes. Um, you testified that, uh, in your opinion, one of the reasons that the medical accreditation is more stringent than forensic is because that there are people's lives at stake in the medical clinical setting. Yes, right? I said that. Isn't it true that there are also people's lives at stake in legal settings? It's an argumentative at first. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, I think you used the language that people could be unduly harmed in the medical and clinical setting. And my question is, if there are uh, errors made in the legal setting too, people could be unduly harmed. Such, such an argumentative and foundation. Well, I mean... Uh, 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 I'll sustain it in terms of foundation. I mean, you, you know that uh, your results or analysis could impact, say, a legal proceeding like this. Of course. Okay, yeah. And I think you, you answered this in kind of a big picture way, but I just want to ask very specifically that your lab does not have the ISO IEC 17025 accreditation. That's correct. Um, one of the number, one of the two numbers that you need to know to determine purity is density, right? Yes. And in terms of the equation, 
that you use that you included in your report, density is the bottom denominator of the equation. Yes. Concentration is on top. Yes. Um, so to be confident that your calculation regarding purity is correct, you need to have an accurate density. Yes. And even a slight inaccuracy can change the purity number significantly. Well, it would have to be an egregious error in the density, which would be difficult because most fluids have a density of about 1.00. Nicotine is in a fluid. It has a slightly higher density, but not more than 1% difference. So even if, it had, if we had used the wrong density, the estimate would only be off by a percent or so. Um, the balance you use to measure density, it, it can only go out, and I'm talking about the instrument, it can only go out two decimal places, right? Yes. Um, there are density meter instruments that go out three, right? And even four, yes. Um, and you have those types of instruments in your lab? We do. Your report didn't include a measure of uncertainty. Correct. And it also didn't include method validation parameters. Correct. Um, the calibration curve wasn't run in triplicate. Sorry, triplicate. It's correct. Um, and I think that on direct, you mentioned your own error rate, but I don't think that that was included in the report, was it? Was it? It was not. Is that a synonym of error bar? Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Um, and so neither were included in your report. That's correct. The report didn't include sample prep information. I think we did include it. We even showed a picture of the sample actually being weighed on the balance itself. And Nothing further. Hey. No questions. Thank you, Doctor. You may step down. People call Detective Wetzel to the stand. All right. <clears throat> Detective, if you could approach the witness stand, please. He's down here. And you could raise your right hand, face my clerk here. You saw me state that the testimony you're about to give and the cause not pending before this court should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the gun? Yes. Thank you. Let's have a seat. Please state and spell both your first and last name. Brian Wetzel, B-R-I-A-N, last name, W-H-E-T-S-E-L. Right, <clears throat> I have one more? Please tell the jury what it is that you do for a living. I'm sorry? Where please, please tell the jury what it is that you do for a living. I'm a police detective supervisor for the Los Angeles Police Department. I'm currently assigned to Gang and Narcotics Division, and I'm a supervisor for the LAPD FBI Fugitive Task Force. And how many years have you been a police officer? 30 years. And how many years have you been a detective? Um, 
approximately approximately 14, 16 years. Okay. Drawing your attention to the date of uh, February 15, 2020, what was your assignment back on that date? I was a detective supervisor for the GN Gang and Narcotics Division, LAPD, FBI Fugitive Task Force. And as part of that task force, were you assigned to arrest a Gareth Purse House on February 15, 2020, sometime after 4 p.m.? Uh, February 15th on 2020, but it was, yes, we started the operation at approximately 14.30 hours, which would be at 2.30 p.m. Okay. And uh, how many members were part of this task force? Um, that day, I had approximately, I believe, eight other detectives out there with me. And what information did you receive in an uh, attempt to arrest uh, Mr. Gareth Pursehouse? As far as like him. photographs, how would you recognize them? What kind of vehicle he drove? Yeah, so uh, we received, we uh, conducted a briefing prior to doing the operation, at which time uh, Mr. Pursehouse was identified, and we had a photo of him um, through his uh, California ID photo, and then physical descriptors, as long as description of his vehicle. Right. And uh, his DMV photo. Uh, did it include a description of his height and weight? Yes. And do you remember what that height and weight was? Uh, I believe it was approximately six, six feet four inches, about 230 pounds. And so you were looking, and you also had a picture of Mr. Persons. Yes, that's correct. And did you know what kind of vehicle he drove at that time? Yes. And what kind of vehicle were you told he drove at that time? It was a 2017 Lexus, uh, four-door red. I believe the license was... Eight, Adam George Sam two six six. And I have a photograph, uh, an exhibit with three photographs showing a red vehicle. May this be marked people's next in order? Yeah, Sixty two. Sixty two photographs, A, B, and C. And that photograph A <coughs> of people sixty two. Do you recognize that vehicle? Yes. How do you recognize it? That's the same vehicle that um, Mr. Pursehouse was arrested in that day when he was driving the vehicle away. And where did you arrest, where did you and your task force arrest uh, Mr. Gary Pursehouse? Uh, we conducted a surveillance at his uh, residence, a record of the address on his uh, California ID with the 8148 Cabrera. Cabrera Drive? Yes. In the city of Playa del Rey? Yes. I have a map, Your Honor, here showing the address of 8148 of Bora Drive. May this be marked as People 63? Yes. Looking at People 63, you tell the jury what is shown there. That's uh, an aerial photo um, of 80, depicting 8148 Cabora Drive. Is that the address you have for, the, for uh, defendant Garrick Persons? Yes. And I have a photograph showing a close-up of a garage and Cabora Street. May this be marked people's next in order, number 64, A and B? Yes. Looking at 64A, you recognize what's shown there? Yes, that's the garage associated with that address, and it's the garage facing, um, leading out onto Cabora Street. Looking at photograph B of this exhibit, can you tell us what is shown there? Um, well, if you look at, that's the intersection of Cabora and Sinaloa Drive. Um, and, okay. Looking at photograph 63, people 63? Yes. It's Sinaloa shown here and Cabora. <coughs> yes. And so about what time did you arrive at the defendant's address? Uh, we started conducting surveillance approximately 14, 30 hours. So 2.30 2, 2 p.m.? 2.30 p.m., yeah. So when you, start, when you say you started uh, conducting surveillance, what does that mean? Um, well, we set up um, an attempt to locate, um, to, see, to locate the suspect. Um, we believe that that was the address of record for him, so we set up on location the event that he would exit, at which time uh, we would conduct a 
um, take him into custody. Okay. So did you have vehicles at different locations on different streets near his address? Yes. And at some point, uh, did you notice a vehicle uh, exiting that garage depicted on people 64A? Yeah, so during the surveillance, um, it was put out that the suspect had exited and moved a bike in front of the garage door, and that then he entered the vehicle and was exiting the garage and then started to pull away westbound on Cabora. Did anybody notice whether any, there was any other passenger with him at the time that he entered the vehicle? Yes, I saw another passenger with him. Can you describe this other person? It was a female white wearing a white sweatshirt. Uh, did you later make contact with this white female? Yes. And look at here at a photograph uh, with the name of Judice Angelina. This we mark people's next in order, number yeah, 65. 65. <coughs> See that there, that DMV photo? Yes. Is that the person you later identified as the passenger in Mr. First House's car on the date of his arrest? Yes. And so you mentioned that uh, defendant First House got into his vehicle, is that correct? Yes. And did the woman also get into the vehicle? Yes, when I saw her, she was in the vehicle. And just to go back to 62A, looking at photograph B, is this a picture of the back of the vehicle with the license plate number of 8AGS266? Yes. I'm looking at photograph C, is that the, the picture of the left side of the vehicle? Correct, the driver's side. And back to 63. Uh, so what happened after, after they were seen entering that red vehicle? So the vehicle pulled away out of the garage and began driving westbound Cabora Drive, at which I ordered that we were going to initiate a stop of the vehicle. And it was a vehicle approaching uh, Sinaloa Road? Yes. And, and so what, can you explain to the jury what happened at that point? So as they approached, as they were driving westbound towards Sinaloa on Cabora, um, as they approached the intersection, I had vehicles pre-staged, at which time we initiated a traffic stop um, right at the intersection of Cabora and Sinaloa. Okay, and during those traffic stops, were, gun, were guns drawn? Yes. And why is that? Um, because it was a felony stop of a murder suspect. And so at that point, you don't know if the person's armed or, or what the situation is? Yeah, that's correct. And was he taken out of his vehicle without incident? Yes. Was there any struggle with him at all? <coughs> no. Okay. Uh, did anybody uh, touch him in any way? Uh, uh, anybody uh, hit him or do anything like that to him? No, he was cooperative and was taken into custody without incident. So nobody, nobody uh, caused any bruises or abrasions on him? No. And... I'm going to play a video clip at this time. It's only at like one or two minutes and ask you if you recognize this as a clip showing a part of that interaction uh, with Mr. Pursehouse on, at the time of his arrest. Is that an exhibit or is it included in it's something a, it's else? It's an exhibit, Your Honor. May this be marked people's next in order? There's, there's 60, no, 66. 66. There's no sound, so there's not going to be a transfer. All right. That's a DVD, I take it? I'm sorry? It's a DVD? Just a DVD. All right. <coughs> Want to play it now, Ron? Yes, of course. You recognize this video? Uh, yes. I recognize the location and the vehicles. I believe it was probably a video taken from one of the responding uh, patrol officers. Are these, at this time, are these members of the unit? The yes. Okay, let, yes. Let me stop it right there. If we could just go back a few seconds.
Do you see a female over to the right mm -hmm. of this video yeah. ad with the timestamp has it as yeah. before that? It, this is at 32, I'm starting at 32 seconds. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to go back a little bit. Right there. Okay. Now I stopped it at 32 seconds. Uh, do you see what appears to be a female on the right side? Yes. And who is that? Uh, that would be uh, Angeli. Angeli Judice? Yes. Okay. don't see the defendant. He's in the video. He's in there. Okay. I'm sorry? Yes, the defendant's in that video. Okay. And can we just back up to that? appears to be in the front of a vehicle? Yes, he's standing in front of a silver, uh, silver Chevy Colorado truck. Okay, and you see the clothing he's wearing? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you another photograph uh, of this of an individual. May this remark people's next in order? 67. <coughs> 67. Looking at people 67. Is that a photograph of defendant, defendant Persaus, the clothing he was wearing back at the time of his arrest? Yes, it is. And uh, after his arrest, was he taken somewhere? Uh, yes. Objection, foundation. Oh, do you know for a fact that he was transported somewhere? Yes, he was transported back to the police station. Okay. And looking back at People's Exhibit Number 62, the vehicle, the red Lexus, did you uh, determine whether that vehicle was registered to the defendant? Objection, foundation, speculation. Well, the defendant's side, but I have to hear from him. You can answer that. Yes. How uh, did you do that? Uh, by running the plate, plate number. Objection, okay. okay. hearsay. And did you do that? Yes. And uh, was a copy of the registration uh, documented? Yes, a copy of the DMV printout. Okay. And did that uh, vehicle with the license plate number 88GS266 come back to a uh, registered owner of Purcell Garrett at 8148 Cabora Drive, City of Planet Delray? Objection, foundation, hearsay. You can answer. Yes, it did. Nothing further on. Good afternoon, Detective Wetzel. Good afternoon. Oh, you, you know, I did forget. I, I did forget something. May I? Go, go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, now, I'm not asking you to answer questions you may not know about, uh, but at some point were you informed that the defendant had been released? Yes. And were you asked to rearrest him? Yes. And was he rearrested on February 19th, 2020? Yes. And were you part of that arrest? Yes, I was. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right, Mr. Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon. Uh, following his Mr. Persaus's uh, February 15, 2020 arrest, he posted bail. 
Yes, I was advised that he posted bail. And then he was rearrested on the 19th, right? Yes, February 19th. Uh, you were part of that second arrest, right? Yes, correct. Was it the same task force? <clears throat> yes. Now, this, it's a LAPD, FBI, I want to get the name right. What's the name of the task force? Fugitive Task Force. Okay. Um, it's comprised of LAPD detectives like yourself, right? Yes. And then and also an FBI employee or two? Yeah, FBI agents. And how many FBI agents were part of the February 15th arrest? On that day, only one FBI agent was with us. And how many on the 19th? I believe only one. The Neither the FBI agents nor LAPD detectives wear any sort of body-worn video when effectuating these either of these two arrests in this case. That is correct. In terms of the arrest on the 15th, um, there were multiple unmarked SUVs that um, were positioned uh, in advance of the arrest, right? Yes. Do you recall how many? I believe we had, I believe it was eight of us out there that day. Each with each with his each, or her own vehicle? Yes, um, yes each, uh, each detective and FBI agent was assigned with their own vehicle. So each, it's one man per vehicle. Man and or woman per vehicle. Publishing People 63, approximately, do you recall where the eight vehicles were positioned um, immediately before the arrest? Um, I believe I had... And if you need a pointer, sorry to interrupt you, if you need a pointer, there should be one behind you. Next. Uh, I believe I had one detective up here. This would be the south end of the residence for 8148. So I had uh, detectives up here in the event that someone were to walk out. It, if I may just make the record. Yeah, so it, I'm looks, sorry. it looks like, no, 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 I just want to make sure the record's clear. <coughs> it appears to me that, that you are pointing at, at Tuscany um, where it hit, where it could, right, in the lower right hand part of the image, where the back of 8148 would arrive on testing. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. Continue, please. Um, I believe I had on the upper right hand corner, not, it really doesn't depict it in this photo, but I had at least two, two units to the east in the event the, in the event he would drive out and drive to the east. Okay, so the rec let the record of like the officer, Detective Wetzel, was pointing to the very upper right hand corner where Kabora was off of the image. Right. And then I had the remaining officers or detectives staged on Sinaloa and maybe Sinaloa and Kabora. And, and the detective is pointing to the intersection of Sinaloa and Kabora. Right. And it, <coughs> so they're, they're placed along. Along uh, Sinaloa, and then also Gabora looks like it turns into like a cul de sac as he goes to the north. Okay, so and, the, and the, the officer, the detective, is pointing uh, towards where Gabora goes off the image on the right hand side. So, um, when, when you ordered for the arrest to, to occur, did all of the uh, did all of, did the single agent and all of the detectives respond to, to the intersection of Kabora and Sinaloa? Not initially. Eventually, yes. Not initially. Okay. In the moment of the arrest, uh, how many of the of the these unmarked SUVs appeared? 
You're talking about the initial arrest, is that correct? Right. Once you give the order for the for the arrest to occur, how many of how many of the SUVs then came in uh, to effectuate the arrest? So the one that was on Tuscany State, the other two on the east, covering the east, they would have stayed. So the only people during the actual uh, at the moment of arrest or the takedown would be three, approximately five vehicles. And they approached in a way so that to, to prevent any uh, ability for the car to drive down Sinaloa or, or Cabora, right? Yes, I believe one traveled uh, <coughs> north to south on uh, Gabor, Sinaloa, right at Gabor, and the other one traveled uh, south and north. I think the remaining traveled south and north, and let the right at the intersection. Thank you. And let the record reflect that the Detective Wetzel is pointing at the intersection of Gabor and Sinaloa. Um, you had somebody with a long gun on a building, right? At which point? Uh, prior to and throughout the arrest until it was clear. I'm not sure what you're saying. You, you, had, you had a detective with a long gun uh, pointing at a building for security. Let, 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 let. So just kind of to cut to the chase, um, the, the, the detectives and the, and the FBI agent were pretty heavily armed, right? Uh, not heavily armed. I mean, we're armed with the equipment that we have. Uh, one individual had like a big shotgun uh, Rifle, with a, uh, isn't that true? Yes, a long, a l one of the long guns was a shotgun. Um, if I uh, I have a few screenshots that I'd like to mark as defense next in order. I'm going to double R. Right. <coughs> double R, right? Excuse me, Not double R, yes. So this is R one. Yes. Yeah. Just so you're clear that yeah, he was that officer, that detective was not present during the arrest. He was one of the off detectives that was staged on the east side. Okay, and he has uh, like a, a big Touch rifle. Right. Sustained based on the court's uh, sidebar. It just occurred. I'm going to sustain the objection. And if all your photographs are going to that, I'm going to sustain the court's own objection under 352. Okay, Mr. Persas was standing. There and saw the, these individuals, right? They, well, they are kind that's cause for speculation, counsel. You don't were, know if you saw okay. them. <clears throat> were you present uh, when Mr. Pershaus was, uh, after Mr. Pershaus was being arrested, sorry, after Mr. Pershaus was arrested <coughs> and the other detectives arrived to the scene of the arrest? Were you, were you personally present? Yes. And Mr. Pershaus was there also? He was there at scene, yes. At some points he was standing, as you saw in the video, facing the, I believe when the, when he stand at the front of the truck, he was facing 
uh, westbound. And where this officer is standing, that would be directly, that's actually in front of the garage, which would be east of that location. Wait, so you're saying that because he's, in that video, because he's facing west, he can't see what's around him? Objection. Uh, no, I never said that. It's a sustain. Colin trying to so establish what he saw. Well, we don't know what he saw, Council Light. Now, if he was, 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 was in the area of that, and he appeared to be looking, that's one thing. But at the same time, even with that, it's, it's not relevant. All right. Uh, publishing RR3. So this is Mr. Kershaw's, right? Yes, correct. And then is that a, a detective or an FBI agent? FBI agent. All right. So this FBI agent has on... Uh, Again, counsel, this is the third attempt. At, at we, we talked at sidebar. You're presenting what was at the scene. And let's approach again. Okay, uh, uh, Council, yes, go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, all of the uh, detectives and the one FBI agent had on vests, right? Yes. These were, you know, bulletproof vests, right? Yes. Tactical body armor, yes. And um, at least a couple of the detectives had large rifles. What you would call long guns, I guess? Yes. All right. The only uh, individuals that had on body worn were the officers who responded uh, after the arrest. Yes, that's correct. So there's actually no video from the arrest itself. Not to my knowledge. Uh, to effectuate the arrest, uh, the entire street in that intersection was completely shut down, right? It was blocked with vehicles. But you're, again, which which street? Kabora, the where Kabora and Sinaloa meet, and, and you know, we watched the video that that Mr. Avila played, and it showed. I don't want to take the time to play okay. it again, but it, it showed, yeah. you know, multiple cars that were parked and blocking, you know, ingress and egress for, I don't know, 100 yards or so, going down east on Cabora, towards yeah. where Cabora and Sinaloa meet. Yes. Okay. Um, and towards the end, an airship arrives. Uh, yes. And an airship is the term that uh, law enforcement uses to describe a helicopter. Is that air support? Yes. Air, air support, yeah. Um, now, you were not... Mr. Avila asked you about whether any of the actions taken during the arrest caused any bruises or abrasions. You were not the one who arrested him, like physically, right? It was uh, Detective Hidalgo. Yes, in my presence. How far away were you? I was standing in my vehicle, so probably within 10 to 20 feet. You were in your vehicle. No. Did you exit your vehicle while the arrest was occurring? Yes, I never said I was sitting in my vehicle at, during the arrest. Oh, I was out of my vehicle. You were out of your vehicle. Yes. I misheard you. And I was present during the arrest. 10 to 20 feet away from Detective Hidalgo? No, from the defendant. Detective Hidalgo was the one who effectuated the arrest. Yes. So are you talking about when he placed handcuffs on him? Yes. Oh, I was probably closer than that then. During the actual when he placed handcuffs on him, I was closer than that. How many? Probably within <coughs> five to ten feet. How many detectives uh, physically detained him uh, to, to put handcuffs on him? I believe uh, Detective Hidalgo was the only one that placed handcuffs on him. Maybe one additional person assisted with holding his arm while he placed handcuffs on? Um, you 
testified that uh, you the arrest occurred without incident, right? Yes. He was compliant. Yes. Um, and he obeyed orders. Yes. He told you where his keys were. Objection. Hearsay. Uh, oh, uh, I think you testified that he was cooperative. Was that correct? That's correct. He was cooperative. Part of his cooperation. Did he tell you where his keys were? Um, I don't believe I was. I don't believe. I'm not sure if I was the one asking him for his keys. Okay. The, the, the strike the answer. All right. Sure. The that you needed like a clicker to get into his garage, and that he explained how that worked. Objection. Hearsay. Sustained. Uh, and foundation. Yeah, sustained. Um, how many individuals were part of the second arrest on the 19th? We had approximately the same. Uh, on the 19th, I believe, 8 to 10. Eight to ten detectives. Okay. And there's approximately the same. There's no video whatsoever associated with that event. Not that I'm aware of. It was up outside of the In and Out at 92nd and Sepulveda. I'm sure there's video somewhere over there. Nothing further. Yeah, we direct. Okay. So, for this arrest on February 15, 2020, we have this body worn video, correct? Yes. And there was other body worn video. Were there other Correct. officers wearing body worn video at, at about this time? On the 15th? Yes. Yes. And was there video of the defendant inside the patrol car once he's placed into the patrol car? Yes. Okay. And, and uh, given the guns that officers uh, had on them, the number of cars and the airship, how would you describe the defendant's demeanor? During all this, overall, you said describe. How would you describe? How would you describe his demeanor during this whole this whole incident where you have uh, patrol cars, guns, and the airship? And also, outside the scope. Uh, overruled. I think that was your point. I'm trying to ask some of the questions. So, go ahead. Um, he was cooperative with what we were asking him or telling him to do, and he was very, his demeanor was calm, calm. and cooperative. Yeah. Do LAPD fugitive task force, do they wear body worn video? Are they required to wear body worn video? No. Why not? Uh, due to the nature of our operations and the surveillances that we're conducting, the, we're not required to wear body worn video. Did you see Officer Hidalgo when he's arresting the defendant, placing the handcuffs him? Do you see him strike him, hit him in any way? Absolutely not. I'm a supervisor, so if that would have occurred, I would have, I would have to conduct a use of force investigation. So, no, nothing like that occurred. I have nothing further. Anything? Uh, two questions. Yes, go ahead. Three. Um, who told you that he bailed up? That he bailed out? Uh, I believe Detective Carranza notified me. Uh, this was what's called a felony stop, right? Yes. Objection beyond the scope of the the redirect. Oh, oh, oh. And that's a specific term that refers to uh, the the manner and the level of uh, force used during a stop, right? Just a biggest level of force used. Okay, but it, it a felony stop is a term that is used to describe uh, the amount of officers or detectives and the the amount of resources and procedures that are put in place to make an arrest. Objection compound. Sustain. Um, Mr. Pursehouse had to lay prone on the ground when he got out of his car. Yes, we ordered him out of the vehicle and ordered him to do a prone position. And so a prone position means that you lay down on, on the ground face down, right? Yes. On your stomach. On your stomach, with your hands Hand, above your head. No, hands out to your side. Hands out to your side. And he did that? Yes. 
on his own accord. I think further. Any? No questions. You may step down, Detective. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. People, you want a good time to stop? It's up to the court, Your Honor. Do you have, well, can you do something in 10 minutes or? No. It's going to be long We won't complete the witness if you want to You're quick to speak to that issue. <laughs> <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and uh, take the afternoon uh, uh, recess. We'll see you all tomorrow at 9.30. Be safe, if you will, please.